Okay, awesome. Let's get started with the video. So today we're going to do a quick review of everything that we need to know um, to be ready for the uh, unit project that we actually have coming up, which is going to be creating an API um, with Express and MongoDB. Right, so we'll be doing that today. And um, in order for us to kind of get that going, I'm going to use something a little bit familiar. I'm going to change it up slightly so it's just not like an automatic answer to the homework. We're going to change up things just a little bit. And essentially what we're going to be doing today is using the uh, to-do application to build two models, a user and to-dos. And we're going to turn that into an API. And I'm just going to go through the pieces of the API as we do that. So right in front of us, you should be able to see on your screen, you should see um, a quick little um, um, diagram uh, that uh, pretty much maps out um, that pretty much maps out how an API works. And And so essentially, what this basically shows us is a visitor coming to a website or somebody just making a request. So a request gets made by the visitor and that gets sent over to the Node.js server. Inside the Node.js server that we're going to have, we're going to have our express application that actually manages the HTTP um, server. And then inside that application, what we're going to be doing is our express application is going to be deciding when we need to talk to the database, when we need to get data from the database, how we send responses back to the user when we're all said and done. Um, and then in, and in certain cases, not today, but we might also have a template engine that makes HTML. Um, and actually sends that HTML back to the user. So, um, with that said, let's run through this real quick again. So, first, like we just talked about, let me just clear these. So, like we just talked about, we're going to be creating an application that can listen for requests, right? So it can listen for those requests. And those requests are going to come in the form of either a get request, a post request, a put request, or a delete request, right? There are other methods that can be used in order to talk to an API. They're not important for us right now when we're building a REST API, but we'll go over them a little bit later in the class. But right now what we're doing is we're going to be either making a GET request, a POST request, a PUT request, or a DELETE request. Right? We're going to be making one of those types of requests. And a GET request basically is when the, is when the visitor just asks for some data. The key that I want to make sure you understand about GET requests is when you make a GET request, you do not change anything on the server. So you don't send any data, you don't you don't ask for anything to be changed, updated, any of that type of things. If you do that, then it's not a pure GET request, right? And you as the API developer are the one that has to enforce that, right? If you don't enforce it, then your API will just behave whatever way you tell it to behave but you're not supposed to put that type of stuff inside the get request. The get request should only be the user says, can I get five to do's? They give you back five to do's, right? They, you say, give me back one individual to do, you get back one individual to do. Now, post requests are different. Post requests can be stuff like logins and, and, and user creations, etc. But the key to something being a post request is that you send data to the server and you don't and you might create new data. Right. But you don't change something that previously existed. You either you you just send data to verify something or you create something brand new that didn't previously exist. That is a post request. 
now a put request and sometimes you might even see us use a patch request also so I'll put that here um, sometimes we might use this but with a put or a patch the key with either one of these is that you are making a change to something that previously existed now the thought normally with the put request is that you kind of change um, change the entire thing that's inside the uh, database like you replace it with something with something new right but you put it in the same position right so you get rid of something and you put something new there now with a patch normally you take one little itty bitty part of your um, of that thing inside the inside the database um, and you normally change just a little small piece of it right so um, that would be the difference there and if you think about um, an example one good example might be if you had like a um, like a buy button in a, on a on a uh, um, in a shopping application and, and when you buy you may not you probably won't make a put request um, maybe you make a patch request and you change the number of the inventory in a database like all you're changing is like one number and maybe there's 430 of them so somebody buys one now it changes to 429 and then it changes to 428 you're just changing that one itty bitty little piece you're not changing the whole entire um, item inside the database and since we're dealing with document based databases we'll just say documents then we're only changing one itty bitty part of the document and a delete request is pretty self-explanatory. Um, explanatory. Uh, what you're doing there is something was there, and now it's not. You delete something that was previously existing. So it existed at one point, and then it stopped existing. And that's the um, and that's uh, essentially what you do there. So that is um, what you are what you're doing in um inside of an api and that, what other thing that i want you to uh to make sure that you understand right is that whenever you make a request it has to be followed by a response right so you make a request you have to make a response so there and there can only be one request and one response right in the full request response cycle and so we'll look at that a little bit closer but essentially once the user makes a request right that's the request that you're dealing with right the user makes that request that's what you're dealing with that's what you're working with and you pass and then and then and then you pass that request around as much as you need to in your internal controller code until you're ready to send a response back to the person that made the request right so they make a request and you make a response you cannot respond two times you can only respond once once that response is sent you cannot do anything else that is also something that uh, that you need to see so key some so make sure that that is uh, understood so um, with that said now that we have those kind of like preliminary things down let's put this into practice and I'm gonna keep this diagram up the entire time and what you should be doing every single with every single word that I say you should be cross-referencing this back with um, what you see up here on the screen and one thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cross out this part here with making a template because we're building an API and so if we build an API we don't respond with any um, with any HTML we strictly grab data right get the data maybe do something with the data and then send it back to the person that requested it we don't do anything here with the templates that is only for when we make a server-side rendered application right and the reason for that is can we make a server-side rendered application like what we did with um, fruits for example right what we are doing is we're making the HTML on the back end so for example the user makes a request right it gets given to express 
Express goes into the database, grabs the data that it needs. The data gets given back to Express. And Express says, hey, before I just send this data back to the user, I'm going to use one of my templates. And I'm going to combine it with the data that I already have, because we're still passing around that data. Express has it, carries that data over with the template. And then the template then um, takes that data, takes the template, and compiles some HTML. And then, and then and then that's what we send back to the user, the HTML, because that's the only thing that users can understand. Now, when we build applications in the modern way, we don't do that, though. And the reason why we don't do that is because eventually in the next unit, so basically starting from July 8th and going forward, right, we are actually going to um, um, create applications that um, run separately from our APIs. And so we're going to build a front end and as many front ends as we want, right? And that front end is going to actually be um, what talks to the API. And so essentially what's going to happen is somebody's going to make a request. It's going to get given over to the server. Right, server is going to bring that over to Express. Express is going to go get the data that it needs, right, and then take that data, process it, do whatever it needs, right, and then respond back with that with with that data. Now the the difference here is that the way it's going to work is there's going to be a visitor, and the visitor is going to be playing with the front end application, right. And the front end application is going to be what talks to the back end, right? And they are going to stay in communication with each other. And the reason why this ends up working well is because then I could, this front end could be my, could be a website. You could have another front end that people interact with, like a mobile application, right? And we can go ahead and do that, boom, boom, like so. And we can make a mobile application, and that also talks to the back end and stays in communication with it. And I started to see this uh, this format get more uh, get used more often once we started to get mobile application and desktop applications. And the reason for that is because that mobile application and desktop application actually needs to be downloaded onto the user's device. So the server side rendered way can only work for websites, right? We don't even need it for websites, but it can only work in a website fashion. And the reason for that is because in a mobile application, somebody actually has to go and download the front end application onto their phone. And then that front end application has to reach out to APIs and stuff to get its data. But you can't, but you're not actually just talking to a website. You download the code locally onto, onto, your, onto your phone. And that's when we started, and also around that time, we started to stop using websites and we started to use things called web applications, which is what we're going to be building in unit three which work the same way as a mobile application or a desktop application, except that you open up the application by going to a website. And what happens when you go to a, a, a web application is um, you really only request one single itty bitty HTML page that has some JavaScript code in there. And when that JavaScript code loads into your browser, your application, I mean, your, your, your browser you know, runs it and gets all of the, and starts to do all the work it needs to load up the application and start running. An example of like a, of a web application might be like Google Maps. You go to the Google Maps website and the web application loads up and starts running. If you ever played like a web-based video game or, um, or even the games that you made in unit one would qualify as web applications. They just didn't actually reach out to a backend at all. Um, and one thing that you sometimes do with web app with with, uh, with these web applications is you actually might make them downloadable onto um, a uh, onto somebody's machine by creating a, a service worker and doing a progressive web application. 
all that stuff is things we're going to talk about in the future. Um, but I want you to understand why we don't need why we don't need views um, and why they're unnecessary for what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do here is do this stuff, right? So that we can connect any front end to these this API. And um, and then it can start to run and work. Um, and this could be a, and, and this API might be an API that you made yourself. It could be an API that you're just bringing in from somewhere else. It's going to still have the same architecture, right? It, re, it responds to requests, it talks to a database. Responds to requests, talks to a database. That's what they all do underneath the hood at a at a base level. Um, so with that said, we've done a lot of talking. Let's actually build. Um, the API now. So I'm going to go ahead and um, come here to my terminal and I'm going to quickly come here and just um, let's just quickly go ahead and create a, um, a folder for us to um, for us to do our application in. So I'm going to make a directory and I'm going to call it, um, let's just call it to do, um, let's say to do API example, right? So we'll do that and we'll see the into to do API example, right? And again, this is not the answer to the homework. We're going to do something different. Doesn't mean that it wouldn't help you do the to do homework. If you haven't done it yet. But I am not following along with the to do homework. I'm just showing you how to build an API and using simple to do's as an example, right? Then from in here, um, I'm going to go ahead and just start making the files I need. So I'm going to need a server.js file, right? I'm also going to need a, uh, let's just start with this server.js. Let's do an npm init dash y which creates the package.json for me. So if I do an ls, I should see package.json and server.js. And if I look at the server.js, I can either use less, which you should already have on your machine. Um, so I'm going to say less um, server.js, right? Um, actually, I'm less than the wrong thing. Less <laughs> package.json, right? And you'll see that um, I have created the package.json. The package.json has a test script, which will eventually change a start script, has main server.js in there, etc. So it's started, right? And I press Q to quit that. So Q to quit, right? Um, make sure you caught that. We need Q to quit. That's how we get out um, of that. So now that we have created that, I'll go ahead and um, make it app.js. And the reason why I separated, whoops, what the heck? Let's see, ls, and I got app.js, no big deal. I'll just mv app.js to app.js, there we go. ls, problem solved. So I made app.js as well, right? Made a little boo-boo at first, um, but then went ahead and fixed it. So we have app.js there and server.js. And the reason why I have um, server.js and app.js is because I'm going to separate them. So this way that I can test app.js apart from the server.js. And there's a bunch of different ways I can do that. But the simplest way is just put them in two different files. So that's what I'm going to do, right? Um, if you want to do it a different way, it's fine as long as you get it to work. But the easiest thing to do is just put one here, put one there, and then you don't have to worry about them colliding or anything like that. And I only want to, and I, what I only want to test the app.js and make sure it works. I want to test that unit, right? So, um, so we'll just keep those things separately. The other thing is why didn't I touch both of the um, files up here when I uh, made server.js? Why did I just make app.js also? And the reason why I didn't do that 
is just because I wanted there to be no question when I ran um, npm init dash y that it would know that the server.js was the main file, right? If I would have made both, then it would have had to decide which one was which. And by default, I don't even remember which one it would have picked. But I want server.js to be the main file, so just so there's no chance for there to be anything to go wrong, I'm just going to use that, right? And depending on which version of Node we have, I think it makes a different decision. If I remember correctly, like they change which one they, the hierarchy of which one they would decide was the main by default. So I'm just going to go ahead and, um, you know, make it so that server.js is, um, is our main file and then just touch app.js separately. So that's why I did it in that order. So now that we got that out of the way, we have our two main files. And then I'm going to go ahead and set up the um, main installations that I'm going to need. Both my regular dependencies and my dev dependencies. And my regular dependencies, right, are, are things that I actually need in production, right? And then my dev dependencies are going to be things that I only need when I'm in development mode. So only in development mode will I need these other ones. So I'm going to start with just the main, the ones I need in production. And what I mean by this is anything that has to do with testing and, 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 and you know, just developer experience and stuff like that. You only need that on your computer when you're coding. Once you actually deploy to the internet, right? You're not going to need those things like super test and jest and MongoDB memory server artillery. That's only for that's only for testing purposes and things like that. So when I actually deploy to the internet, I'm I'm making a distinction between my regular dependencies and my dev dependencies, so that when I deploy, I only install the ones that are needed for production. So it makes my my um, overall size of my application smaller and also keeps us from getting any um, dev dependencies tend to have more security vulnerabilities and they get fixed slower. And the reason is because nobody should be using it in production anyway. So even if you get one of those one of those issues, it should never see the light of day for somebody to be able to exploit it. Right. So there's less. So if there's an error or a bug in react which does get used in production or bug in express that needs to have a whole that means to have a whole different level of urgency for that for that um for that to be fixed as fast as possible right but if there's an issue in like mongodb memory server or super test the thought is eh we'll get around to it because that vulnerability should never be an issue because you shouldn't be running it anywhere where anybody has access to exploit it to begin with. So there's a different level of issue there. It's like, put it this way, if the lock on your bedroom door doesn't work, you might eh, take a couple weeks to fix it because you're like, eh, it's in my house, right? But if the lock on your front door to your house is broken, right, you're probably gonna fix that the same exact moment it occurs because you don't want people to be able to just walk inside your house. So those so those regular dependencies, right, are going to be exposed and available and people can actually touch them. Right. Um, so that's like the front door of your house. But like the dev dependencies are like your bedroom. Now, you need to make sure your stuff works correctly in your bedroom, et cetera, but not with the same urgency. So that's the difference there. Um, and that's a very watered down difference. But I think you get where I'm going. So I'm going to install my regular dependencies first, and that's just with npm i, and I'm going to install install Express, which lets us create our HTTP server. I'm going to install Mongoose, which allows us to talk to our MongoDB database, right? I'm going to use .env, which allows us to hide our environment variables, right? And then I'm going to install let's install JSON Web Token which is going to allow us to make JWT tokens, right? And then we'll also install Morgan and we'll install bcrypt, which allows us to hash our passwords, etc. So we'll do the we'll do that first. We'll do those installations. 
express mongoose dot vnv right etc etc right let's see let me fix that sudo n and let's say uh sudo n 14 right and this is just me doing this i needed to uh do a quick update no big deal because this is telling me that i'm using 14.17.6 on this machine i haven't used this i haven't used this computer that i'm on right now in a long time right and it's telling me that hey in order for me to use these packages correctly I need it to use 14.20 or greater. So I upgraded to the bare minimum version that I can upgrade to 14.21 um, so that I can do that instead of jumping up to like 18 or 20 or something. And remember, I never use odd number node versions because those are not LTS versions. I only use even numbers, 14, 16, 18, 20. If it's not an even number, it is not going to be long-term supported, so I'd advise against you ever using a node version that starts with an odd number. So if you use an even number, you are safe and they will keep upgrading it for many, many years. Um, and you can always look at the Node.js um, website in order to, um, in order to see that, um, what that is. So with that said, I'm gonna go ahead and run npm i again which is just repeat the installations that i've already done because now they're in the package.json file i didn't get rid of package.json that would be bad i got rid of the package lock so i can get rid of any references to this node version right so that's what i did and so i'm going to go ahead and npm install um those those real quick and those should get installed and you've seen they installed without the warnings because now I'm on a compatible node version. So that's all done. That shouldn't be anything you have to do yourself. All right. Now that um, I am, have done that, I'm going to do the same thing. But now I'm going to add the dash dash save dev flag. Right which essentially is going to tell it that these are all going to be dev dependencies. So I'm going to put jest. I'm going to put super test, right? We're going to need that. What else do I need? Let's get the MongoDB memory server. So MongoDB memory server, right? Um, and let's get artillery. And let me get at 1.79 because I want that stable version. Uh, is it 1.7.9 or 1.7? I think it's 1.7.9. Pretty certain that's, that's the case, All right? And we'll go ahead and run that. telling me to don't use one version one but we're going to do that anyway because to my knowledge they still haven't at the time of this recording they have not made the updates to two that would that would make it um, make me okay with using it currently and those are all internal updates the way you use it doesn't really change Home, and we should all be good to go there. So now that we have added each one of those, um, we can look at the um, at the package.json again, and you'll see that you have two listed dependencies. We have the regular dependencies, which have stuff like bcrypt.env, express, JSON web token, mongoose, morgan, all things that we're going to use in our actual application right 
And then we have our dev dependencies of the things that we're only going to use in development, like artillery, Jest, MongoDB memory server, and super test, right? So as you can see, they're in two separate lists so that um, Node.js will be able to differentiate between which ones are dev dependencies, which ones are dependencies, and then act accordingly when we push something to production, right? So I'm going to go ahead and quit that. So that's our basic setup. Now that we have done that, next thing that I will do is I am going to go ahead and I am going to um, create a um, git ignore file, right? And I could do that in VS Code. So um, I'll just do it in VS Code rather than do it from the command line. And that went over here and I'll just go ahead and pull it over here. And now we've got our little setup here. So I'm going to go ahead and make a new file, I'm gonna make a dot git ignore. And so before I do anything with my dot env, I'm going to do that first, right? So what I'm going to quickly do is I am going to tell it to ignore my node modules, right? And I'm going to tell it to ignore my dot env. I'm going to do this before I create um, my .env file to just ensure that it that there's no way that it actually gets uh, you know screwed up and sent to GitHub or something along those lines because that's a big issue for me if it happens because that's going to have my secret information. Once I've done that, I'll go ahead and open up the terminal here. I'm in the right location. I'll do a quick PWD. You can see I'm where I believe I should be. And I'm just going to just say that I would like to make this a Git repository. So I'll go ahead and do a Git init. And now I have a Git repository here. Right? Then I'll go ahead and I'll touch .env. And in .env, I am going to set up my Mongo URI, right? Which I'm going to change off screen. But for right now, I'll just go ahead and say Mongo URI. And that's going to be equal to something, right? And I just need to put that information in here. So um, make sure that you let people know they need to make the .env env and what it should look like inside your documentation in your readme. Make sure that's the case. If, the, if somebody doesn't know they need to make the .env, then, the app, then they'll never be able to run the application on their machine. So this is something you need to make sure you tell them in the steps when you are creating your, um, creating your project uh, for um, your unit two. So we'll go ahead and save this. And so now that's saved, right? And I'm going to quickly just go ahead and um, pull this off screen, right? So let's do that real quick. Another thing I'm going to do, actually, before I even do that, so I'm also going to let you know that I'm going to create a secret. I'm not going to tell you what it is either. Secret is just going to be a really, really long string of characters, right? That I'm going to get from a SHA-256 SHA SHA hash, right? That I'm going to put here. So pick your favorite word and make a SHA-256 hash. If you don't remember how to do that, all you got to do is go to some SHA-256 generator, right? This one right here that pops up all the time is fine. Put in some words you like. Boom, boom, boom. You will get some um, SHA-256 hash back, right? Copy that hash. Use that as your secret. Just make sure this word here is a word that you, that you know, right? Like something that you're going to remember. If it's not something that you're going to remember, you're not going to be able to recreate the hash 
should you forget it. So use a word um, that, that you remember, save it somewhere, um, and you'll do this like in a kind of like nonchalant way because you're just doing it for yourself on your machine, but your company that you work for when it's generating these things, you probably won't even be the people generating it because your whoever is in charge of security will probably generate those things and give you these give you these type of things whenever you are um, whenever you need one um, or they'll have some way that you're supposed to store it um, in a secure location um, using vault storage or something like that um, you know for your company so your company will have some way to maintain these secrets but when you're just doing stuff for yourself you've got to figure out your way so you can just save the word in one password or or um, you know uh, you know uh, what's the other one one password and the other ones that are like one password that like our password storage mechanisms that you can use you can even store them in secure files and things of that nature there's a lot of different ways for you to do it but just keep in mind you do need to keep um, access to the secret so like I said just make a quick shot to the hash copy it and paste it in here so all you got to make sure you do but just make sure it's it is a SHA-256 SHA hash because if it's not it's not going to work properly so keep that in mind so with that said I'm going to quickly come here and I am going to put my Mongo URI and my secret in my .env I'm doing this off screen so you cannot see because I don't want to share it with with you um, no offense And then I'm going to save it. And then I'm going to have it generated for me. And then I'm going to close my .env file. And so now my .env file is closed. And I'll share this over here again. Right. So with that said, now that we have done those initial steps with the .env, now we're ready to actually start building the application. So I'll start by going to server.js and in server.js, the very, very top of the file, I'll go ahead and I'll require, right? Um, DOT ENV, right? Dot config. And then invoke that function and that will pull things from dot ENV and make it available to me in server.js, right? So I'll do that. That'll be the first step I do inside the server.js. And then I'm going to make a directory for models, for routes, and for controllers, right? All plural. And inside of models, I'll quickly just make a new file. And I'm going to call that user.js. I'll get started with the user. And I don't have to do anything special here. This should all be um, something you've seen a lot of times, so I won't really talk about it too much as I do it. But I'm just literally just going to make a user that has an email, a name, and a password. So I'll go ahead and say const mongoose is equal to require mongoose, right? I will say const um, bcrypt is equal to require and we'll require bcrypt and we'll say const jwt is equal to require json web token and also we're going to require dot env dot config and you might be saying hey do we need to do that everywhere and the answer is no we need to do it everywhere where we need to get access to process.env and we're going to use it in this file so if i need to use so if i so if you ever are even if even if you don't do this at the beginning once you notice that oh crap i need to get access to process.env then you go ahead and add this to the top of the file right that's all you got to do you don't have to memorize it or whatever or say oh i need it in this file i need it in that file it's never going to always be the same it's always going to depend on where do you need to access your environment variables. 
And so once you see a place where you need to access the environment variable in that file, then require dot config at the top of the file, right? Only when you actually need that. And we're going to use it here to get access to our secret. So that's the reason why um, I'm saying I need it. So I'm going to go ahead and create the user schema, right? Remember the user, sch user schema is like the bouncer. Doesn't let anybody into the club if it doesn't match the, um, the structure of the schema. And so I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'm going to make this a little bit stricter than I made it before. This is always going to be a personal decision based on you and how you're developing stuff. And me, I'm going to be strict here. And I'm going to say that the type of this is going to be a string. And I'm going to say that required is going to be true. So it is required, right, for, um, for me to have this uh, name. Then I'm going to go ahead and do email. And I'm also going to say that the type of the email is going to be a string. Required is going to be true. But then also I'm going to say that unique is also true, meaning that I can only have one person with the same email. I can't have two people that use the same email. It's also going to um, something to remember in production. I mean, in, in development, because you can't just create users over and over and over again with the same exact email. Otherwise, you'll get an error thrown when you do that. All right. You can only make one user with the with that email. And I'm going to go ahead and say password. And I'm going to say the password. It's also going to be a string. And it's going to be required. Right. So that's what I'm going to say with all those. And I'm also going to do this just for teaching purposes so that I don't need it, but also if I want to see timestamps, which we'll see in a second, what they look like once we actually start making these, but I'm going to say timestamps and I'm going to say timestamps are true, right? Because essentially what I want is I want basically to know whenever somebody, um, I want to know when somebody, um, I want to know when somebody creates a user, when the user gets deleted, like that, I mean, when the user gets modified, etc. And timestamps will keep track of all that stuff. You know, make extra fields called created at, updated at, um, this way that I'm aware of when these thing, when the when the user's created and when the user gets updated, etc. Right? Then we're gonna go ahead and say user schema dot pre, right? And we're going to say before we finish saving, right? So anytime somebody tries to save, let's go ahead and add a little async function. Don't use an arrow function here. We are using a function with the function keyword on purpose because we're going to use this in here. And then we're going to go ahead and say if this dot is modified, right? And we're and here we're talking about the document that we made from the schema. If that document is modified, so if that user is modified, and particularly we're talking about the password is modified, right? We just want to know that, right? And if that happens, we just want to do some quick code. And actually what I'm going to do is I'll make that with a, instead of doing an if statement, I'll just do this. Boom. This dot is modified password. If that is true, then this dot password, right, um, is going to be equal to us awaiting, right, for bcrypt to hash the password, right. And we'll use eight salt rounds, right? And 
that'll be what we do. And I'm actually going to put this on multiple lines. We'll say if that, then do this, else do nothing, right? Um, and then we'll just say null here. And we'll put, basically, we're not going to do anything if that's the case, right? And then we'll go ahead and call next. Right, so that's what we'll do there. Um, and that's just real quick. And then uh, we could also add a model. I mean, another uh, function real quick to the to the uh, to the actual model itself. And there's a difference between these two. I want to make sure this is super clear. So I'm going to say user schema dot methods. Right, and we're going to say dot generate. And we're going to say dot generate um, um, auth token. Let's use that terminology. And we'll say that when this happens, right, when someone does this, they're going to be able to um, essentially, uh, they're going to uh, be able to make the JWT token on the fly. So we'll say const um, token is going to be equal to JWT dot sign and we'll say um, what will we what will we put in the document? Let's just say ID and this dot ID. It's a, we'll, we'll just only do that because that's good enough. And then we can use that always to look up the um, to look the person up. And then we'll sign it also with the secret, which will be process dot env dot secret. Because we also put the secret in our .env, not just our um, not just our uh, Mongo URI, and then we'll return the token, right? So we'll just quickly do that. So now we have this um, generated. Um, like we have we have our schema set up and generate auth token is basically going to work on you know any um any document that we get back we'll be able to call generate auth token and we'll be able to generate a token for that um document which will be a user right and remember documents just will be called things that are stored in the da database and you can see when i hover over it you can see that we uh the user schema right Mongoose.document, etc. I won't super break that down right now, not to make it too complicated. But at the end of the day, um, we're going to eventually generate um, individual documents um, by creating new users. And those are going to be the documents that we find out of our database, right? Those little objects that are in the database that represent users. Those are our documents. And we want to say that whenever one of those documents gets saved, right? We want to check and see, did we change the password? If we change the password, go ahead and um, re-encrypt the password. Um, and also, we want to have a method that we can call whenever we need to make a token. So we don't have to redo the token creation logic over and over again. So we can always check and see whether or not the token is, um, the token is valid or not. So that is going to be something that's going to be helpful for us. And then we can add any other methods that we may think of that we might need. And we could add methods to any schema that we create. It's just that these are the methods. This is just what we chose to add to the user schema. And then what we're going to finally do 
is we're going to go ahead and create the user model. I'm going to go ahead and create the user model. And I'm going to say mongoose.model. Right? And I'm going to go ahead and say user. And I'm going to say user schema. And then I'm going to module dot exports is equal to the user right and then save so there we go now we have our user model next thing we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and look at and create our to do so I'm going to go ahead and make another new file and I'm going to make to do dot js right and in here we're going to do the same thing I'm going to do a little destructuring just to make things a little bit faster for me I'm just going to go ahead and say I want the model and I want schema right that's the only thing I need for mongoose and then I'll say equals require and we'll require mongoose right and we'll say cons to do schema right is equal to a new schema only schema not mongoose that schema because I destructured schema out of mongoose instead of what I did in user which was I imported the entire mongoose library and then I had to do mongoose that schema and mongoose that model here but since I destructured it destructured model and schema I'm only gonna have to write model and schema in the rest of the file so I'll go ahead and do that and I will say I'll create a new schema and in this schema um, we'll go ahead and we'll say the title and we'll say the title required true and I'll say type string and then I'll also go ahead and say completed and we'll say type and we'll say the type of completed is um, do we want boolean or string I go boolean let's say boolean and we'll say require true and then we'll also say timestamps and we'll say true right and we'll say cons to do is equal to model and we'll say to do and we'll say to do schema and we will module dot exports right and we'll say module exports is equal to to do and we will do that and we'll save it and we'll also do something here and what we're going to do here is we will say user and we'll say the user is going to be uh, let's say type is going to be schema dot types dot object ID and we'll say require true and what this is going to do 
is this is actually going to allow us to say every time we create a user, right, we're actually going to create, I mean, every time we create a to-do, it's going to belong to a certain user. And I'm also going to go to the user.js and I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to go ahead and say to do's going to make it an array of mongoose. Let's say type is going to be mongoose dot schema dot types dot object ID. I'm not going to require it, right? Cause when I first make the, make the, uh, make the list, I'm not going to have any to-dos yet when I first make them, when I first make the user. The user creates an account. They don't have any to-dos yet. So I'm going to start with that. And then I'm going to say that for the to-dos, um, I'm going to say the ref is going to be to-do. And that ref, essentially, is going to be pointing to this actual string right here. And that's going to tell it that we're referring to this collection in the database. So this thing inside of inside inside the um, inside of the string and that ref there have to match, right? So make sure that that is the case. They have to match. And we're also going to go ahead and make a ref on this one for user, right? And boom, now these two things are related to each other. So now we need to make our controllers. Right? So we can start. Well, we just need some functionality for, I mean, we need basic functionality for each one. Um, the user controller is pretty, pretty simple. We don't have to do anything crazy here. Um, I'm going to go here to user.j, I mean to uh, controllers, make a new file, call this one users.js. And I'm simply going to just say const user is equal to um, dot dot slash is equal to require. All right. And let's say dot dot slash. And we got to go over to models and then we got to go ahead and get user. And then we're going to say const decrypt is equal to require decrypt and then const um, JWT is equal to require. JSON web token right so now we got that and then we can make our function so I'll say exports dot off and this is the function we're going to use as a middleware function just to always check and verify that the user's authorized to do something, All right? So we'll do rec res and next here, All right? We'll do a try and we'll do a catch. And we'll essentially say here that the token is going to be equal to rec dot header, right? We're going to look in the authorization headers. So we're going to look in there and we're going to do a dot replace. And we're going to look for the bearer token that should be there. We're going to look, so we'll look for the word bearer space and replace it with nothing so that we only get to the actual token. We're going to say const data is going to be equal to JWT dot verify. And we're going to use this to verify the token. 
So we're going to verify token, right? And we're going to use process dot env dot secret to verify the token. And because we had to use process dot env dot secret, we realized that, oh, Arthur, you know what you need? You need to require dot env dot config because we want why are you doing that VS code NeoVim wouldn't do that <laughs> so we went ahead we did that and since we know we need process env dot secret we know we need that so boom we threw that in there and then we'll say the conch user is going to be equal to us waiting right for the user dot find one right and we're gonna find one based on the ID that we have and we're gonna say data underscore ID and why are we doing that we're doing that because at the end of the day we're going to take the we're going to take the um, the ID that was inside the JWT's data. And now, where the heck do we know? Why do we know that the J that that, that the, we should have data in here? Very, 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 very simple. When we created the user model, right? We also made that generate to, generate auth token method, right? That generate auth token method creates a token by signing the JWT and adding the ID and the um, and adding the ID from the document along with the um, the secret so when we decrypt it right when we verify it we get that back we're going to end up getting back the data of the tokens verification and so we should get an object back that has the ID in it it might have some additional things inside the payload, which is why we won't just take data and just drop it directly in here. We want to only get the ID. So we're going to take data.id and use it to look up the user in the database. So we just have to know the flow of the way our stuff is working. Because remember, when the user when the user tries to um, when the user signs up, right? Remember, we're not doing any of that. When the user signs up, right? which we haven't written this code yet, but we're about to, they're going to hit a, um, a login route that and they're going to send their 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 login information. Right. Or they're going to try to hit any route. Um, you know, it doesn't matter which one it is. The auth functionality is going to run. They're going to have to send the token with that. Right. But the only way they got the token is if they went to the login first. So they go ahead, they log in. Right. They log in with their information. What's going to happen is we're going to receive that in Express and then we're going to do a couple of things. First thing we're going to do is we're going to is when we're and this is when we're logging the user in. So again, what I'm going over right now is log in, which we're about to make that functionality in a second. We're just making the auth functionality first. So we're going to log in. When we log in, we are going to get a password from the an email and a password from the user. So we're going to go ahead and take that email and we're going to use the email and I'm going to show you, we're going to send the email to the database, right? Send the email to the database and tell us to, and tell it to find us a user, right? That can, um, that matches that email in a database. That's why we want it to be unique. So we can only find one at a time. So we're going to find, find the user that matches that email. Right, then they're going to give us back that user. We're not done yet, though. We're going to end up talking to the database again. Um, well, not really. We're not going to talk to the database again. We're just going to process the data because then we're going to take that user that we got back and then we're going to verify the password. So then we're going to verify the password. Right? If the passwords match, so if the password's a check, then we're going to send back to the user the token, right? So keep that in mind. We're going to send the user back with the token. 
when we send the user back with the token though right um the token inside of it is going to have the id and the um is going to have the id inside of it so when so when the user so when we're when we're running the auth middleware we're actually checking that token to verify the token is valid when the user gives sends us a new request but they send it with the token and their token is their way of saying that i'm authorized to do this check my credentials so we're verifying those credentials and we're going to and when we do this jwt.verify it's going to return to us back whatever we originally scrambled up inside the token and we're going to use that data right to find the user when when that's all said and done right if we can't find if, if if we can't find the user so if there is no user so we can't find the user then we're going to go ahead and throw an error no matter of fact i'm just going to go ahead and say not user right question right throw right throw new error and we'll throw a little error message in there that says um couldn't let's say couldn't find um user right or bad credentials let's just say bad credentials bad credentials right couldn't find the user else right we'll say rec dot user right equals um the user if we do find it so you throw a new error or there we go So that's what we will do there. We'll either see that hey, the user is um, the user is. Uh, we either do that, or we'll do that. Right, one or the other. Let me group that because it seems to be doing a, an issue. That's just VS Code thing because it's definitely not an issue with the code. VS Code doesn't just doesn't like the way it looks, for whatever reason. Whatever linter is set by default, it's like it doesn't like it. Just so VS Code doesn't keep doing that, because I don't like looking at red squiggly lines, and it keeps making me think there's an issue, and if there's not, so I'm just gonna throw the new error here, because then it shouldn't give me the issue here. Seeing it recognizes it here. Code would definitely still compile, but. I'm not interested in seeing that over and over again. Cause that's just gonna get on my nerves. Right, and then we don't even need the else because this that code this code since we already threw the error, the code would be unreachable. So I'll just say rec that user equals user here. And then we'll call next. And the reason like I said, why I'm not worried about putting this inside of else because if we throw an error here we if we actually throw the error we're already going to eject out of the try block so these lines won't even run so there's no reason to put it in the else it's just extra code that i don't need to write so we're not, not going to bother doing that um if you want the else that's fine and then we'll say that we'll say we'll do a res.status i'll actually throw a 401 right um, instead of just a regular 400 for bad request so I actually say unauthorized and then I will go ahead and um, and let's do a JSON and let's do a message and let's say that's going to be equal to the error dot message in this case we know exactly what that is because we made them we made the message right here bad credentials 
So I'll send back a message that says bad credentials. Done and done, right? And so that's what this does. This is for, this middleware is going to check for the authorization header, right? We're gonna take the token out of the authorization header, right? Verify that it's valid. If it's valid, the data is gonna be equal to the data we use to create the token, which remember is just the ID of the user. And then we're gonna take that, right? And we're going to use it to find it, find the actual user in the database, if it existed, and store it inside of rec.user so that we can use it in subsequent requests, I mean subsequent uh, functions. So that's what we do there. The other ones are pretty simple. So, for example, we'll do exports.createUser. And that one is just going to be as simple as we do an async function and we just run through just the steps of just generating a brand new user. And there's a couple different ways for us to do it. I'm going to do it the way that we've been doing it, um, which is a pretty good way. Um, there's multiple ways to do it, but like I said, I'm going to just do it the way that we've been doing it. So to get started, I'm going to go ahead and say const user is equal to await, right? And we're going to wait for user, right? Um, actually, it's not even await it. Let's just make a new user. Only await if I do create, but I'm going to actually do it step by step. So we'll do use direct body, right? And then we'll so then we'll just save the user which will take care of hashing the password. All right, because of the pre-save hook. So remember, the, the, when the user signs up, they're gonna give us plain text. But before we ever save, remember we encrypt the password, All right? So now we take care of encrypting the password by making it this way and then just saving it. So cool. And then we say const token is equal to await, right, user dot generate all token. And now why do we do that? If we look, remember, the user schema dot methods generate all token. What this is going to do is make it so anytime we make a brand new, we, anytime we have a document that is a user, we can call generate auth token on it. And then we'll do this functionality. So we're using that to generate our auth token, right? Because we have a user document. How do we get a user document? Because we went ahead, right? And we called new user with rec.body. So we made a new instance of, of user and user, right? instances of it create documents and then we save that document to the database and then now we're also going to say const token is equal to await user dot generate auth token so we make the token and then we use that token to send it back to the to send it back um, as our response and so we're going to go ahead and say res dot json right and we're going to send back the user object right and then we're also going to uh, send back our token so we're going to send an object with two keys the user which will be the user object right and the token which will be this token that we got back so that's what we should see whenever we run that and if we get an error we'll just go ahead and send back a response with the error in there Instead of 401, this is going to be a 400. We tried to do it, didn't work, so we'll just say it was a bad request. And whatever message the error that gets thrown from one of these functions has, that's the message that we'll see here. So now we got create user. Now we get into the fun one, the one we drew out here, which is the one that's maybe the hardest to wrap your head around. I think creating a user is simple. 
think about it, let's we'll come back to creating a user just we'll just run through it one quick time but all it is is user gives us the, the data that we need to make the user if they gave us the wrong data we'll throw an error and then we'll send back a bad uh, like a bad request but they give us the right data we'll make a new user document we'll save that document to the database we'll generate a token and we'll respond with the user data and the token right back to the front end in JSON format simple enough as it is we make we that we get some data from the use from the person that wants to make a new user and then we save that data to our database and send back that and send back that saved data back to the user really really simple there the login is also simple but you got to make sure but, but but understanding the login means you understand how everything works because understanding the login requires you to think about how somebody's going to use the route. It's not 100% clear just from the code. You need to understand, and most of you do because you've logged in on websites before, what happens when somebody wants to log into a website. What do they do? They enter in and their credentials and they try to see if they can get access to what they believe they should have access to. So that's what we're going to do here. We're going to say conch user right is going to be equal to await right user dot find one and we're doing the first step we're going to try to see if we can find a user with the email because we're going to be looking up the um we're going to be looking up the user in the database via their email address Right, so when they log in, they're gonna type in their email and password and try to log in. And then we're gonna say, we're gonna look up rec.body.email because that's what the user sent us. We're gonna use that to say, hey, does a user even exist with that? Now if, right, and this one I actually do wanna use an if statement. We don't have a user or, right, we try to await, right, for bcrypt dot compare right and we compare rec dot body dot password Got the comma for a second. So we go ahead and we try to um, compare the password of the user with the password the user provided us, right? If those two compare correctly, then we're good. If that if we if we were not able to compare them correctly, then we have a problem. And then we're gonna say res dot status, right? Um, Four hundred. Um, actually, let's just throw an error. Let's say throw new error. And I'm just going to say that the message for the error is invalid login credentials. Right? Else, if that all worked, right? Then we're going to say const token, right, is going to be equal to us making a new token from that user that we found. Remember, we look up the user, right? So we, and then when we find the user, what we get back is a new, is a, is a, is a user document that we can use. That user document is going to have that, uh, that generate auth token function. And so if we were able to successfully look up the user and verify the password was correct, then we should make a token. And then we'll say, that we await, right, for the user dot generate all token, right? So we go ahead and generate that auth token, and then we say res dot json, and we're going to send back the user and the token. Right? So we send that back. 
And if we don't do that correctly, we'll do a res.status, right? We'll do a 400, and we'll say .json, and we'll say message, and we'll say error.message. Right? So what we're saying is, somebody tries to log in. They send us the rec.body that has an email and a password in it. It comes down here in Express. Express takes it over and Express starts to do its controller thing. Right? Remember, we're looking at these controllers, right? And Express is going to do its thing. And what we're going to do here is we're going to decide what we want to do, right? And what we want to do here is we want to take that rec.body information and use it to um, look up a user in the database. So we look up a user by the email in the database, right? Make sure you see where this is happening. It's happening right here on this line. We look the user up. If we, if we um, successfully find a user, we're good. And then we try to, um, and then we also try to compare the password. But let's say if we couldn't find a user, we would throw an error and we would send this back if we can't find a user, right? That's if we can't do it. If we do successfully do it, that's where the or comes in because if this is true, then we check and see if this is true. And so now we're looking to see whether or not we can compare the password that the user gave us with the hashed password in the database. If those two are good, they compare correctly, then we're fine. If we're not, we throw an error and then we send back this information and we send back the error message. If we are good, then we generate a token with that user that we found. So we do user.generate auth token. Cool. We make a token. And then we send back the user and that token information back to the person that made the request. Right? That's what we're doing in login user. That's how it that's how it works. We're assuming um, that we get that that we're either going that we're you know we're not making any assumption actually. We're checking to see if the user gave us back an email, um, a, a valid email and a valid password um, pair. If they did, then they will get rewarded with a token. If they don't, then they will not get rewarded with a token. They'll get rewarded with an error message, right? So that's what we, that's what we're doing there. When we create a user, it's working a little bit different. The user sends their rec.body, we get it in Express, and then what we do here is we use the rec.body to make us a brand new user in the database, right? Then we get that data back and it gets saved inside of the user, right? Um, after we try to make it, and then we save it to the database, right? This is actually between these two lines where we do this, where we do this set of transactions, right? Between line 24 and 25, like that's when we're doing that. We make it, we, we basically generate the user and then we save the user to the database, right? Now, after we've done that, then we're going to generate an auth token, right? And then we're going to send back the user data and the token data back to the person that made the request, right? And if we got an error along the way, we'll send back the error message. And so that's what we're doing there. So now that we see how to create a user and how to log a user in, now it's up to us to go ahead and, and update and delete a user. So when we update or delete a user, we're going to assume that um, that the user is already authenticated. Now in the version that I gave you in class, we didn't do authentication on updates, but we 100% should, right? Remember in the assignment, I told you that you should add that. Right, so that was something I was looking for you to do as your as your groups. Some of the groups added that. Some of the groups um, didn't realize they should, 
but we're just going to add it to both. We're going to add it to we're going to we're going to make it so that when you try to update a user, you got to be authenticated, right? And then also, right? Whenever you um whenever you make a Oh, excuse me. Ooh. Can we delete that. Um, but whenever we um whenever we create a new user, we're going I mean whenever we update a user, we're gonna to have to be authenticated. And whenever we delete a user, we gotta be authenticated. We gotta make sure that only the right person can update or delete themselves. So let's start with update a user. So I'm gonna go ahead and say exports um dot update user. Right, is going to be equal to a sync. Rack res. Right, we'll do a little try catch. And our try catch will say const updates. Right, is equal to object.keys right rack dot body and these are the keys of all the things we want to change on the on the user and then we'll say const user is equal to us awaiting right for user dot find one right and we're going to go ahead and we're going to find a user with the ID that's equal to um, the rec dot user, right, dot ID. And actually, technically, since we already know what we want to up, since we already know the user we want to update, we can get around actually looking looking it up. So we're not even we're actually gonna skip that part. Because if we're gonna use the rec user anyway, we don't need to. We only need to do that if we need to use the rec params to find the user, but we can make an optimization here and not do that. So we're gonna say for every single update, we're going to go ahead and take the rec user, right? The user we have saved from off because when we do our routes we're going to call off before we call update because you need to be authenticated so we'll already have authenticated the user and found the user right remember that's what we already do here we find the user right that was inside the token and we're just going to go ahead and quickly say we're going to update rec.user right with that particular update data and we're going to make it equal to rec.body bracket update now remember our rec.body is going to be an object that has a bunch of keys in it right all the stuff we want to update on the user what we are saying here is we're going to make an array of all the keys let's say that the person updated email name and password right all three so then we'll have a we'll have an array of email name and password right and then what we're going to do is we're going to call for each on that array and we're going to say for each particular thing on the user that we want to update we are going to take the corresponding key in the user and change it for the new data inside of rec.body so for example if rec.body.password was new then we're going to change rec.user.password to be whatever rec.body.password was. If rec.user.name, right, is Arthur, but rec.body.name is Superman, well then the new name is gonna be Superman, right? So we're gonna do that for each one of the updates. Then when we finish that, we're going to await for us to save that user. rec.user.save, save that user right and then after we save the user we'll do a res.json and we'll and we will respond with the user data and we and um, keep in mind we're sending just the user 
as the as the data we didn't send the user inside of another object so it's not so it's not going to be response.body.user it's just straight up the body is the user and that's what we chose to do there could we do it different? We could, but there's no reason to put an, an object inside of another object for no reason, right? And then if we get an error, well, then we'll go right ahead and say res.status, right? 400.json, you guessed it, message, error.message whatever error message the error that we throw has that's the message we'll send back and then delete user is going to work the exact same way right very um obvious code right or at least obvious pseudo code i should say because if you don't know the syntax you just don't know the syntax but logically we know what we want to do we want to find the user and get rid of them. So we'll go ahead and we'll do a try catch here. And we'll find the user and then get rid of the user. As simple as that. So with that said, let's go ahead and get rid of the dang user. And so all we got to do is we'll just call on await. And we'll say rec.user.delete1. Right? That'll get rid of the freaking user. And then we'll go ahead and we'll respond back. Essentially, all we're saying is that, hey, the user's gone. Right? So we'll say res.json. Right? Um, and we honestly don't need to respond with anything. We'll say res.status or res.send status. And we'll say 204 which essentially just means that, you know, there's nothing to say. <laughs> like, it's done. Like, we, uh, like, it's empty. Which is what you expect um, in, in our case, because we deleted it. We can, we could also, like, just do a 200 response to send, like, a message back saying, hey, it's deleted. We could do that, too, but we don't need to. So, boom, we deleted the we deleted the user. As simple as that. And we have a rec.user only because we're going to make it so the user um, that the that, that we already saved the user in the request um, when we took it out of the token. Right? So we take it out of the token and we save it in the request. We save the user in the request. So that's why that update user and delete user already know who the user is because it's in rec.user. But login user wouldn't know that because we don't have anything saved here because we are, the users just straight up logging in with their email and password. So we don't know if they are who they say they are yet. And we don't have any token to look at. The only thing we're going to look at is just point blank is the is the username and um I mean is the is the is the email and password correct? If it is, then we're going to generate a token and we're going to respond with that. And that token is what we're going to use whenever we run off, right? We're going to take that token, verify it's good, get the get the um the data out of it, and then use that data to look up the to look up the user. And if I can find the user, then I'm going to go ahead and save the user and wreck that user and then do the next thing I want to do, which is either update the user or delete the user. Done and done. And voila, user controller done. Now let's look at to -do, the to-do controller. All right? So let's go ahead and make a new file. To-do.js or to dos.js, let me rename that. It should be plural for the controllers. And here, we're not going to do anything special. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to say const to do 
is going to be equal to me requiring that to do model that I'm going to need. Right? And I want you to keep in mind that um, that the to do um, is going to um, you're only going to be able to do stuff with to do with an with an authenticated user. So we're always going to know who rec dot user is. Keep that in mind. So we're going to make an assumption that we always know rec dot. Um, we're always going to know. Um, how can I say? We're just always going to know how to uh deal with it to do if that makes sense like well like we're we're never not going to know what to do with the to do so um we'll start off with um exports right dot create and we'll go ahead and we'll say that we're going to make a async function Right. We're gonna um we're gonna make async function and we're gonna say that it has rec and res inside of it. Yeah, let's just do it like that. Let's not make it more complicated. And then we'll say try, we'll say catch, and then we'll say const to do is just going to be us um, creating a new to do. Now, keep in mind, like I said, we always know who rec.user is. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to say await, right? And I'm going to do a couple of things, right? First thing is um, I am going to assume that I can get access to, right? Um, that I can get access to the to do's um, user um, in a simple way. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to say um, rec dot body dot user is going to be equal to. Um, is going to be equal to um, rec dot user dot um, id underscore id and then I'm going to do a to do dot create right instead of using the new because I don't need to call to do dot save so I'm just going to do that and I'm going to call rec dot body right and this is just a shortcut to do a lot of stuff we're doing before. The only reason why I'm doing why I did it the other way before we're actually went under the hood and actually take the extra step to say new user and then save the user is so that I can get my automatic functionality here to always work where every single time I save the user, I hash the password, right? I don't need any functionality like that. So I'm just going to use the create method that does all the steps for me, right? And so I'm going to create that to do with that user from rec.user.id there. And then um, after I do that, I'm going to res.json the to do. And if I get an error, I'm going to res. Um, status 400 dot JSON message and um, error dot message right and so we'll do that then we'll say exports right um, we'll say, we'll, we'll, we'll say, um, 
we will do another function for um for show so we did create right let's do um show and we'll say export exports dot show and we'll say async function rec revs and we'll essentially say here that what we're trying to do is we're just trying to find an individual to do so we'll go ahead and we'll find an individual to do And we'll say const to do is equal to await to do dot find one and we'll use the um direct operams that id so we'll say the id is going to be equal to rec dot params dot id So I'll find that individual to do, and then we will res.json that to do. And we'll do a res.status here of 400.json. error dot message that's all we need there for that um, so now we can see an individual to do and then we're going to need two separate indexes right and the reason why I wanted two separate indexes because we should have an index for whether or not we want to show complete to do's or incomplete to do's right so we'll have a list and we're going to say exports dot index complete and we'll say this one right is going to be um equal to this and we'll say index index complete and we'll say um this this one is going to be equal to a function an async function We'll do rec, we'll do res. And for this try catch, we'll essentially say, we're gonna do the same thing. As a matter of fact, I'm about to be lazy because I'm, you know, we're typing a lot of stuff over and over again. It's gonna be basically the same thing as this, except for I'm gonna get more than one to do. So instead of to do dot find one, we're gonna do to do dot find, which will give us back an array instead of worrying about the ID, because we don't want to find a list of things with the same ID, we want to find things where the completed is true. That's all. If it's completed true, then, then we're good. And that's what we want to be in this list. And then we'll do the same thing for this next one, which will be exactly the same, except for, um, let me actually change this to to do. Even though it won't change, won't matter if I do that, just so it reads better. If I name those variables whatever I want. And then we'll say index not complete. And these are arbitrary names for the functions. You can name them whatever you want to name them. I'm just saying this is my index of complete to do's. This is my index of not complete to do's. The only thing that changes here is this will be false. Right? So completed to do's incomplete to do's right now the other thing that I could do right is I could also go ahead and only show to do's that belong to the current logged in user and the way that I'll do that is I will say um, user right 
and I'm going to say that that should be, um, and I'll say that should be the um, the 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 user ID. So we'll do rec um, rec dot user dot underscore ID, and we'll do the same thing on the other one as well. And then we'll save that. And now we have the index uh, not index complete, index not complete. And then we can also um, um, update it to do. And all we want to do with the updating it to do is we're really just going to uh, basically say, you know, just update the to do, like at the end of the day. And this also because we're not worrying about um, saving um, by hand. We're just going to use the built-in method. So we'll say exports, right, dot update is going to be equal to async function. And we'll just quickly say that this is going to be the same as the other functions, if you haven't caught that by now, because we're not doing anything special here. We're just going to use the built-in functionality. I'm just going to say boom, boom, boom. And instead of find, we're going to say find one and update. And then we're going to say that's going to be an individual to do, though. So we're going to say find one and update. And, we're, and, the, and the things that you put in here is slightly different, like the arguments that you give it. So we're going to start off. Um, we're going to start off with the thing that we want to find it by, which is going to be, we're going to find it to do um, by its ID. So we're going to say ID is going to be rec.params.id. And then we're also going to use the re and then we're also going to say um, rec.body is what we're going to update it with. Right? And then on top of the rec.body, we're going to say that new should be true. So new true, like so. Right? So that we get back the new to do. And then we're going to send back the new to do back to the user. And if we get an error, we get an error. So that's what we'll do there. And then finally, we'll do the same thing for a delete. And then we'll say delete. And we'll do find one and Right, boom, boom. Verify I spelled it correctly. Find one and delete. And we're just going to, and the only thing we need for that is just the ID. Right. And we'll just do exactly like that. Then res.json. We'll do res.send status 204. Boom. And so now we have all that functionality. Now, one thing before we move on is you see that we created the user, I mean, created the to-do with the correct user. But remember, the user also is going to need to get updated with its to-dos. So with that, so since that's the case, that's why I want to go ahead and make one additional tweak. And we're also going to import user to only use in that one location. So we'll say user is equal to require. And I'm adding this because 
I realize I need the user. You don't have to have it memorized what you need and what because it's going to change from time to time when you start relating things together. Just know, hey, I need to use the user model. Well, that means I need to import it then. Right? So we require it at the top so I can use it. And the only thing I'm going to do here is I am going to take the rec.user, right? And I'm going to say um, rec.user.todos. Right. If I have to do's rec dot user dot to do's dot add to set. Right. And I'm going to add the um, ID of the to do we just made. So I'm going to say to do dot underscore ID right so we're gonna go ahead and do that and then we're gonna say else we're gonna say rec dot user dot to do's is equal to an array Inside of it, we're going to put the ID to do dot underscore ID. Like so. And then we're going to say rec dot user dot save. Right, because what we're saying is, we're gonna say rec dot user dot to do's. Does that exist? If it exists, then just add the new to do to that to that list. If for some reason it doesn't exist, make a brand new array and drop the to do dot underscore id in there, and then do a wait rec dot user dot save no matter what, because then we need to save the user and then send back the JSON to do, right? So that's what we're going to do there if we create create a brand new user. And that's the only tweak we need to make there to keep them connected to each other, right? So now we have this connected, um, we got this connected joint now. Now let's go ahead and make our routes. So I'm going to make a new file for users.js and make another one for, um, what is it called again, um, todos.js. Right, so that's what I'm going to do now. So let's go ahead and see what we can get there. So for the, uh, we'll start with the user. User routes are fairly simple. Not really much, not really much to say about them. We, we just going to go ahead and, um, you know, we're going to say const um, express and all, and we're just requiring express because we're going to need it in order to make our router. So we'll require express, right? After we require express, we're going to create the router and we'll say express dot router. Right, and um, and I'm gonna pause right here because it's not really any educational information here. I'm just gonna drop it in here and talk about it. So let me just go ahead and type this up um, and do the same thing for the to-dos, and I'm gonna show you how they connect. Just so this video doesn't get too too long with just me typing. I'm pretty sure you're 
can skip through me typing it through anyway. Cool. So now we have the um, the um, routes made for users.js and for todos.js. Essentially, for each one, what we're doing is we have just a quick little thing here. So for todos, you see that we that we're gonna have a slash todos route. It's gonna require the user to be authenticated, and then you will be able to get the completed the 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 completed todos right i um, mean though the not completed to do's right and then we'll be able to get the completed to do's here and then we'll be able to delete it to do here and update it to do create to do show could to do remember we're always going to call the auth functionality first to verify the token and find the user and then do the to do action and then for users we're going to do we're going to be able to allow the person to create a user and log in a user without authenticating themselves first because that's the purpose of those two routes is to create a user and then authenticate the user. So we can't ask for auth on these two because there's no way for that to happen. So these routes would just not work if we did that. But whenever they want to update themselves or delete themselves, they'll have to be authenticated first. So that's all we're doing with those. And then um, what we're going to do now is we're going to just go ahead and set up our app object right and our app object is essentially just going to be another uh, quick thing that we add in I'm gonna go ahead also and for the app and the server I'll just talk about them in a second but I'll pause the recording drop them in app and server.js and then talk about them briefly but um, it's really quick there as well and this video is already going pretty long so now we have our to do's right um, and our users um, we have both of our routes uh, mounted here, right? So now when we go to slash users, we'll be using the user user routes. And then when we go to slash to do's, we'll be using the to do routes. And then we connect that over in our server.js here, where we just import the app, right? And then we use the app to listen for the server. And we also connect with Mongo with, with MongoDB here as well. So now that we have that running, we can check and see if we have any typos. Um, I'm going to go to package.json really quickly, and I'm going to add a dev script, and I'm going to say dev, and I'm going to tell it to run nodemon. I'm not sure if this machine has nodemon installed globally, so I'm going to do a sudo npmi-g nodemon. Right, and look, I didn't have it installed. So there we go. And then we'll clear, and then we'll say um, npm run dev. Right, and we got a crash. Let's see, controllers, user controller. Oh, because uh, we didn't just, we didn't, I mean, user controller inside of control is kind of redundant. Um, I think some, sometimes I do that when I'm teaching, but I don't really need to do that, and I forgot to change it like that there but we should leave it the way it is at the end of the day inside the routes I need to fix that so let me go here and let me just say users here save and that's gonna be the same thing inside the user route itself so let's say users boom and then boom and then we're connected and Mongo showing love so we're Good to go there. And um, so now we have this connected API, right? So there we go. That's how we that's how we put together everything that we've done. Make sure you go and walk through the video. Um, we already have previous videos that I'm going to link that show you how to do how to create the tests and also how to um, uh, how to create the tests and then also are going to show you uh how we um you know kind of just you know work with everything together i just wanted to use this as a review of the main parts of actually putting the api together and getting the api um running um but now that and then also connecting together both the uh the users and to do's together 
because now they are connected all together as one. So if you follow along with this, um, now you should be able to go ahead and make a user, and you should be able to go ahead and make to-dos, and you should see the users and the, the to-dos connected. Um, and then that's how you'll know that you have followed all my steps correctly. Um, so with that said and done, um, I'm going to go ahead and share this. Um, I have another video that I'm going to put out um, specifically going over what you're supposed to do for the project. Um, and if you can get through all of this work, this is the main work, then all of the other things are going to be things to make sure that you did your that did your work correctly and make sure that you don't have errors, you don't have bugs, etc. And you have to make sure that you understand the steps of how everything is supposed to work. So for example, with the to-dos, if I was to go to, um, let's say, uh, let's look at Postman real quick. And we'll just do a quick thing really fast, right? I'm going to go ahead here again. I'm not going to go through this part slow because this I'm going to assume that you know how to do because you should have already, because we have videos for this and I'm going to link them. But I'm going to go ahead and, cre and create a user. So I'm going to go ahead and say HTTP colon slash slash localhost colon 3000, right? And I'm going to say slash users, right? Which is what I'll use to make a user. I'm going to make this a post request, right? So it's going to be a post request. And I'm going to create a user with an email, a password, etc. And so I'm going to make an email. And I am going to say that the email is going to be uh, a at a.com. We'll just make that one to start off with. We'll make the name AJ. And then we'll make the uh, password. I'm dope, right? And we'll say I am dope. And then we'll go ahead and try to create that user. We'll send it. And then boom, we get a user. We get a token back. Right? So we created the user. Now we'll try to go ahead and copy that. And I'm going to now try to go ahead and make a new to-do. So we'll say to-dos. Right? And then I'm going to go over to authorization. I'm going to say bearer token. I'm going to go ahead and drop that bearer token in there. Right? So now the bearer token's in there. We're going to go to the body. And we're going to, uh, I need to remind myself actually, what is the, uh, the model for to do's look like? Um, we need title and completed. Right? So we're going to go ahead and say, um, let's just say title, and we'll say hello, and we'll say completed, and we'll say true, right? And then we'll go ahead and send that. And you see now we created a brand new, we created a brand new to do with hello, with true, with the user. And this is the ID of the to do. And this is the ID of the user that we actually created. So voila, like we have this working and we can go through each one of them. But you just go through these steps and verify that everything is working the way it's supposed to work. Right. So all good to go there. This video has been about two hours. I'm going to stop it here. And we'll have some other videos to follow up.